good afternoon. Good morning. I think we're just into the afternoon. Nice to see people. I'm Phoebe. Um, we're going to wait just for one or two minutes for people to arrive. Once you've joined the webinar, feel free to give me a little hello, give me a little thumbs up or a little good morning message just so I can see who's with us. Hello. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining. Hello, lovely to see you. It's a very strange experience this because obviously there are lots of you here, but it feels very solitary. <laughs> anyway, it's lovely to know that you guys are all listening and watching. So today I'm going to just sort of talk a little bit about how this session will run um, just while we're waiting for others to join us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience working in theatre. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the shows I've been involved in, um, the tours I've done, that kind of thing. I want to leave a lot of time for questions. So if at any point you have a question or you want to ask me something about what I'm speaking about at the time, feel free to just jump in with a question. I'll either answer it straight away or I'll come back to it at the end. Um, but yeah, there are lots of things I want to talk about today. I want to talk specifically about the sort of challenges of how we keep it fresh. So if you're doing, for example, a long run, I've done a several sort of shows where you're in, in one show for a year, and you're doing the same show eight or even nine times a week. Um, and I'd love to share with you some of the things I've learned about how to sort of respond to that challenge to kind of keep what you're doing fresh and different every night, really, rather than feeling like you kind of go into autopilot. Um, I'm sure lots of you, you will have had wonderful experiences with YMT, um, with BYMT, when I did it right when it began. Um, I, I was really lucky to do about seven shows, I think, uh, with BYMT, and it completely changed the course of my life. So I know that you guys will all have had similar experiences, which is why you've joined us today um, and why you're listening to what I'm going to share with you. So I'm really excited to see you. So I'm just going to wait for a couple more minutes um, and then we will kick off. Anyone else that's joined, feel free to say hello so I can get a sense of how many people we've got listening. We've got 34 so far, which is fantastic. Can have a little sip of my coffee while we wait. So, what I'm going to do just to kick off is tell you guys a little bit about who I am and what I've done, uh, and then we'll move on to a few questions. So, I'm going to share a. I'm going to have a go at sharing this. Let's see how this goes. A little slideshow with you all. Now, a little disclaimer, I'm not brilliant at the old technology, so, uh, so my slideshow is fairly basic, but it will hopefully be a good jumping off point for lots of nice questions and discussions. Here we go. So, in fact, I'm just going to keep it this small. I'm hoping that you guys can all see it. Okay, so keeping it fresh. As I said, that's kind of the thing I want to talk mostly about today. Um, and as I said, I'll start by telling you guys a little bit about who I am. So, I'm Phoebe Files. Um, I, I'll just tell you a bit about my training. Now, if you're like me, you are the kind of person who's quite obsessive and likes to sort of take notes, so do feel free if you want to, to write anything down, because my PowerPoint is more like a sort of a jumping off point, really. But, um, so I went to the University of Bristol, actually, after I left school. I studied drama and English as a joint honours degree. Um, the reason I chose to go to university first was because I really loved school and whilst I knew I always wanted to be an actor, I kind of felt that I wasn't ready to kind of give up on learning really in terms of an academic sense. Um, and it's something I'm really glad now that I did because one of the things I do when I'm not acting is I'm an English tutor and it's a really important part of my life. It's a source of income and I really enjoy it. And yeah, it's something I'm really grateful for. So, so I chose to do that first and I then went to Mount U to study um, a one year postgraduate degree in what's called theatre performance, but really was kind of musical theatre. So I was very lucky after Mount View to uh, sign with an agent, wonderful Bobby Chat from Global Artists, who I adore. And uh, I was lucky enough to get a first job in a show in the West End um, called Once the Musical. Now this was an actor musician show and I what I'd like to do is just show you guys a, a sort of trailer of the show because I think you'll get a much better sense of what the show was if you don't know the music already you'll get a sense of how it worked 
I'm sure lots of you guys all play musical instruments. This is a little window into the world of what it is to be an actor musician. So I'm just going to set that up now. Okay, here we go. How long do you think you stay? So a little window into what kind of show that was. I'd love to find out a bit later on about whether any of you guys do play instruments. Um, I've just seen here, uh, Neem, I think it is, saying that one of her friends was in Once the Musical in the West End when she was around six. <gasps> wow. So I wasn't in the same company as Abby. Um, but, oh, can see if you leave me to me join. I'm going to just plow ahead until I'm notified that there's any issue technically, because I think it's working for most people. Um, yeah, I'll wait to be told by... Yeah, okay, we'll carry on. So, um, yeah, so in Once the Musical, there was uh, a company of young actors, who were sort of six or seven, and it sounds like Nimbo is one of those, but unfortunately, Abby wasn't one that I was working with. Um, so I then went, off, went on after Once the Musical to do something completely different. I got a job at the Shakespeare's Globe Theatre performing as Ophelia in Hamlet. Um, and it was a completely unbelievable experience. We toured the world for two years and we visited 196 countries in that time. So the idea of the tour was to visit every country in the world. The show was kind of, that the idea to do it rather was sort of conceived by the artistic director at the time, whose name was Dominic Dromgall. And he curated a festival at the Globe in 2012, so the year of the Summer Olympics. And he invited companies from all over the world to perform each of Shakespeare's plays in their native language. So it was this incredible festival where you had a kind of, um, you had a company performing Merry Wives of Windsor and Gujarati. You had companies performing um, Midsummer Night's Dream in Swahili. It was unbelievable. And this festival was such a success that Dominic decided he wanted to kind of return the gesture and take a touring production to visit every country in the world. Now, obviously, there were a number of countries, although surprisingly few, maybe about four or five countries that we weren't able to get to um, because they were in kind of very unstable situations politically. Um, they're quite dangerous countries to visit. The kind of countries we weren't able to reach were countries like, for example, um, Syria uh, or Libya, countries that are very sort of war-torn or affected by political unrest at the time. So what we did instead of reaching those countries was we would go to the borders of the country and perform in refugee camps to families who were natives of that particular country. So for example, whilst we couldn't get to Syria, we went to uh, an enormous refugee camp called Zatari, which is on, in Jordan, but on the border with Syria. So whilst we weren't able to get into Syria, we, we performed to around 900 members of Syrian families uh, in that area. So it was a wonderful experience. And again, rather than trying to explain to you guys what it was like and how we moved around and all that kind of stuff, and those are questions I'd love to answer in a little while, I'm gonna share with you another video, which is a trailer um, for the show. And it sort of breaks down, you'll get a really good sense of what that experience was like. Um, it's about three minutes long, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the whole thing run because I think it's a much clearer way of me explaining to you guys what that was. So, I'm just gonna plow on, hope this works, and um, you guys just give me lots of notifications, etc. if it isn't working. So here we go. Uh, share screen. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you can see this YouTube page. Okay. Yes, thumbs up. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. 
I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see. Oh, can't move this out of the way. Hold on. So we've just got to Manju, which is on the very eastern border of uh, Cameroon. There is no venue as such, and we've managed to negotiate playing here in the kind of full court of what is normally a private bar. <laughs> I think it might just be the best outside venue we play in terms of the surroundings. Good afternoon, and a very, very warm welcome to I think it's great that they're doing this because it gives an opportunity to other for other countries to really see what the Globe Theatre is about and what they do. I'm delighted to be here in Colombo, what I think was going on, they laughed a lot at the skulls and the grave digging scene with the bodies. They laughed a lot when people were killed. Uh, what do you think was going on with that laughter? It's another way of escaping those serious, you know? Issues. For us, death is not as... Uh, as uh, we're not afraid of this because we live with it. At the moment we have a uh, electrical bulb, one of the lights blue on stage and so it's gone to complete darkness and we're waiting for a man coming from his house with a key for a phase box to see if we can change one electricity phase point to another. <laughs> And it's mad, they're like every time we go on, they're clapping us and like they're, they're singing along with all the music and clapping along. It's brilliant, it's really good. And it's time for us to leave her. There we go. I didn't want to stop that before that beautiful bit of music finished. So I, I'm, I'm going to talk to you lots more about how that job worked because as you can probably see, it was completely unique and very few actors, I think, will ever experience, ever experience anything like that kind of extent of the touring that we did, you know, traveling so quickly, moving from country to country. But one of the other things that made that particular job unique was the fact that, so we were a company of eight actors. Well, in fact, we were 12 actors, but at any one time on stage, there would be eight people and we would rotate to have evenings off to give us a chance to recover when we were traveling at such a fast pace. 
So in order to do that, we had to each learn how to play several parts. Some people is up to six or seven different roles, which is kind of common if you're doing, um, playing swing, for example, in a show. A swing means a person that understudies or covers several, several roles uh, at one time. But what was even more challenging was that we had to learn the music and the instruments for each of those roles. So another thing that we'll discuss later is that in an actor muso show, obviously when you have understudies and covers and swings, there's a whole other element. So not only are you learning the, the script, the blocking, the costume changes and all of those plots, but you're also learning the instrumental parts and potentially having to pick up new instruments to sort of accommodate those. So huge, huge challenge, but a completely life-changing experience. Um, and yeah, lots of, oh, we've still got some, we've still got Neem saying I can't see it. So I'm unsure about why that might be, because it looks like lots of other people can. So I'm gonna keep plowing ahead. Um, so I'll just really quickly now, having talked about those two jobs in a little, little bit of detail, whiz through um, a couple of, well, sort of the, the other sort of shows that I've been involved with. So let me share this with you. I'm gonna just zoom in rather than trying to share just in case rather than trying to make it bigger in case that's causing issues um give, yeah keep letting me know if there are any difficulties here but it sounds like that's all working all good here good okay so after i did hamlet um, i went and did a fantastically wonderful show called the world goes round at the stephen joseph theater which is the scarborough six of us it was a very a very short job only around sort of eight weeks of a run um but it was fantastic and i don't, I don't know if anyone's been to scarborough but i fell in love with it we call it scarbados because whilst it is rarely sunny when it is it is beautiful i then went on to uh take part in peter pan at the national theater where i learned to fly it was a fantastic job it was, I don't know if anybody would have seen it, it was all aerial, um, by aerial I mean lots of kind of, um, how to describe it, lots of flying basically. And we did a particular technique of flying which is called counterweighting. So you have people on the side in, up, running up and down ladders and in our version you can see that happening. And they are attached by a sort of pulley system to the person that's flying. So if you can imagine that if you're on the ladder, every time you go down, the person you're flying goes up and every time you go up the person goes down so it's this kind of incredible dance really between the the counterweighter and the actor um, and it taught me a lot about sort of i don't know about sort of working together as a team it's kind of the most specific example of you know you can do your thing as an actor but actually you need to be a hundred percent in tune with the technicalities of what is happening in the wings and in our case, as I said, they, they weren't in the wings, they were also on stage. Um, I, the next show I did, which was another actor musician show, it's called A Little Night Music. If anybody, in fact, give me a little wave or a little, a little yes, if you've ever been to the Watermill Theatre. Now that, this is a theatre in Berkshire. It is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. <laughs> um, it's a tiny little theatre, it's built on the site of an old watermill and they're kind of leading pioneers in creating actor musician work um, again we'll talk a little bit more about why i personally find actor musician work really exciting um, but i'd love to know give me a little shout or a wave or anything if, if any of you play instruments and have questions later on a bit about we can talk a little bit more about that i went on to an oscar wilde play um, in the west end called a woman of no importance uh, which was a brilliant experience some really uh, fantastic actors were in that show, actors that I'd sort of looked up to for a long time and it was a wonderful experience to work with them. Um, and then, yeah, went into The Mousetrap, which as you may know, is the longest running show, um, I think anywhere ever. It's been on, I think close to about 70 years. Um, and I was lucky to play Molly, who's the lead um, role in that show. It was a huge challenge because we had to do nine shows a week. So that's, that's one show more than what your standard number of shows per week would be. Um, and I must confess that that really was a challenge. And that's sort of what's led me to talk a little bit about how we keep it fresh, because that was kind of the thing I found most difficult. I only did the show for five months, but we weren't allowed to take a holiday or anything like that. So it was a kind of long uh, process and a long road to get to the end of but obviously learned a huge amount and loved 
moments of that job as well. Um, and then most recently, I've been in a version of Assassins, which again was at the Watermill Theatre. So that's a sort of little brief overview of the sort of kind of work I've done. As you can see there, I've sort of managed to um, do Shakespeare in sort of straight theatre, the Oscar Wilde play and other things like that, as well as musical theatre, um, which is something I always knew I wanted. Um, and I think is something that can be difficult to achieve. So it, for me, it was really important to make sure that I had access to playing parts that weren't just in big musical theatre jobs, even though I love those jobs and I have enjoyed doing them. But I wanted to make sure that I could sort of try and build a CV and a career that was more varied and gave me the ability to sort of cross over really between the two sort of genres. Um, great, Maze is just saying here that she's loving hearing about acting relationships. So maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that now. So I'll stop sharing my screen with you for a second. Um, I'm gonna just, have a little pause to look at some of these questions that have come in and then I might go back to answering some more questions that I've sort of thought of myself. So I'm going to go back to a question from Hannah which came in at the, near the beginning of the session. When you were doing the show how do you take leave from your job as an English teacher or do you still teach when you're rehearsing and performing the show? Very interesting question Hannah. So in my case because I'm not a teacher in a school um, I I have the flexibility to tutor in my own time um, so I think it would be different if you are a teacher because I think you would need to take leave but because what I do is tutoring privately and I do that through agencies as well it means that I um, can sort of be relatively flexible in terms of my timetable so if I know that I've got a nine-month commitment to a show coming up then I'll make that clear to the families I'm working with and often I will continue to work with the students throughout that time the only difficult period tends to be the rehearsal process so that can last between four to six not usually longer than that eight or maybe eight weeks um, and obviously during that time your days are fairly full during the run of a show I would try to keep some of those students on because as I say it's a, it's uh, useful for me to feel that I have something to go back to when I'm in between jobs um, yeah and kind of on that note one of the things that I think is a useful piece of advice and and, and I was grateful to receive it when I was a bit younger was if you are thinking about a career in theatre, just really trying to think broadly about what other things you're good at and what other things you love. And that's not to say because you won't make it as an actor because you absolutely, you know, there's no reason that you won't, but it's more that even actors who are at the top of their game and are, you know, getting all the lead roles and all that kind of thing, it, you never go from job to job. So you never finish a job. I mean, sometimes it happens, but you're never gonna carve out a career where there are no periods in between and it's really important I think not only for your kind of sense of purpose and your own mental health but also you know we don't all have we need money in between jobs so you know theatre in itself isn't a massively well-paid industry it's not like television or um, film or kind of Hollywood films so it is important to just tap into at this age I think while you're you know before you have responsibilities and all that kind of stuff into what, if I had to do something else on the side, what would it be? Um, and in my case, that is sort of working in education and it's something I really enjoy. Um, so that's something I'd say is to, don't, don't, don't allow yourselves to think that's a kind of diversion. If anything, it's something that's gonna help you achieve what you're trying to do because it will facilitate your work in theatre. It will be alongside it. I think for a long time I thought, oh God, well, if I become a teacher or if I work in education, then I'm, I'm distracting myself from my, my main goal. And I've learned to realise that they're kind of, two things go hand in hand in my experience. Um, oh, goodness me, wow, Annie, Annie, what are your tips for performing Shakespeare? <gasps> well, my tips for performing Shakespeare, really good question. I mean, there's hundreds of kind of really useful books and things that I would recommend in terms of the technique of speaking the language. Um, I, 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 I'm gonna avoid sort of, linking to too many of those at the moment because I'll just try and use my own experience to answer that question. Um, but performing Shakespeare, I would treat it like any other text to begin with. It's so important to absolutely understand what you're saying, which I know goes, you know, is a given. Um, I think often when we read Shakespeare aloud, we sort of fall into the trap of reading it like it is a poem 
And yes, of course, Shakespeare writes in the most, you know, intricate and wonderful poetry. Like his form is fantastic. But I would say use those as kind of guideposts. But all the time you're trying to convey the message of the character. What does that character want? Um, what are they trying to get? What, how are they going to achieve that kind of thing? And so I would say I would try to avoid the sort of density and the complexity of the language getting in the way. It should be used as a sort of, I see them as kind of goalposts. So when you're speaking in what we call iambic pentameter, some of you might have heard that phrase in English, um, which basically means, um, well, the sentences go like this. Da-dum, 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 da-dum. So you have 10 syllables and five stresses. So da-dum, 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 da-dum. Iambic pentameter is the thing, is the kind of form which most accurately mimics our, the way we naturally speak. So if I'm speaking to you right now, it sounds a bit like iambic pentameter, apart from that last bit. <laughs> um, so again, it's kind of allowing, allowing the poetry to sort of speak itself and not getting tied up in knots by how complex it is. I'm going to leave my answer there because I could go on and on and it's quite a specific niche area, but um, I'm really happy to expand on that a bit further. So Annie and anyone else that's interested, do feel free to get in touch with the BYMT office and they will forward any questions that you might have in that area to me because I'd love to talk more about it. What instrument, this is from Carrie, what instrument is most in demand for actor museo shows? Really good question. And actually I think probably I'm going to start by answering a bigger question, which is what is an actor musician? So really, an actor musician is an actor who plays an instrument. Now, so I play the violin, that's my main instrument. And, and I'm, I would say sort of highly skilled, which is the term you have to use on your CV, your spotlight CV, if you're an actor, on that instrument. I do play other instruments. So I play the piano, I had to learn that from when I did once the musical. And I sort of can pick up the guitar and one or two other instruments. So I would consider myself an actor musician. There are many act musicians who play far more instruments. Um, some people play up to sort of eight or nine. So you might want to consider if act musicianship is something you're interested in and you feel excited by the question, what do I already play? And what other instruments can I kind of easily pick up and add to my toolkit? Um, it's really helpful often in act musician shows, if you're in an audition to be able to say, yes, this is my main instrument, but I'm really good at picking things up. And I'm, I'm really prepared to work hard and learn something. So when I did Hamlet, for example, I didn't play the accordion, but I had to convince the musical director that I was prepared to have a go at learning it and just put in the time and the effort to make that happen. So, so that's just kind of a brief overview of, you know, if any of you are thinking about becoming an actor musician, then you, you are one instrument away from doing so. So if it's something you're excited by, absolutely pursue it. Um, in terms of what instrument is most in demand, it's really hard to answer that question. Um, there was a time when it was sort of less fashionable for piano to be part of act musician shows just because of the nature of it being quite a big instrument. But once the musical was built around a piano, um, you might have seen of, seen of, or heard of, or seen in live, seen live, uh, a production of the last five years, which was on at the Southwark Playhouse earlier this year. Um, the two actors that were in that played the piano themselves, they accompanied one another. So actually, I think piano is up there. Um, I think instruments that are portable are generally quite popular. So things like the violin, the flute, the clarinet. And again, it just depends on the show. So I, the version I did of Assassins recently, um, those of you that know that score, um, Sondheim musical, will know that it's kind of quite brass heavy. There's lots of, lots of trumpet, lots of trombone, um, French horn, that kind of thing. Whereas there are other shows like, for example, A Little Night Music, which I took part in in 2017, which are just much more sort of string heavy. That was more like performing the chamber orchestra. So there was cellos, there were, there were two violins, two cellos, um, what else was there? No viola, clarinet, so a more kind of classical setup. So I think it's hard to pinpoint what's the most in demand. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, if, if something feels portable, I think that's kind of a good gauge on whether or not it would be useful in an actor musician show. Good. Okay. Sky. Lovely name, Sky. I play a few instruments, violin, piano, guitar, and I sing. Sounds just like me. Is there a popular instrument that you would recommend picking up? So I would say, Sky, for your kind of um, skill set, the things that you could pick up really easily, I think, if you already play the guitar, 
would be other instruments like the banjo maybe or the mandolin um the mandolin is a really good one if you already play the violin because the strings are the same so you've got g d a and e so if you can play a tune on the violin you can already play the mandolin so i'd say definitely have a go at picking that up um it's worth saying as well have a have a look at sort of before you go out and buy you know four new instruments because they can be expensive have a see if you can borrow one see if you can rent one and just get acquainted with a new instrument. And if you think, God, I'm really enjoying this, I love it, then maybe commit to buying one. But I think sometimes we can kind of rush out and I've done that before and spend loads of money and then never pick it up. So just have a little think about it, but here we go. Okay, Lucia or Lucia, I think. Again, another lovely name. Don't know if you already covered this. Um, oh, what was my training? I'll very quickly just say that. So yeah, I went to university, I studied drama and English. Um, as a joint honours degree and then I went to Mountview uh, in, in the North London uh, for a year as a postgraduate degree. I'm going to move on from that because I have talked about that a little bit. Oh and the same, and the same person's asked how did you find it to quickly learn all those instruments in Hamlet? Um, I, to be honest it was the whole rehearsal process was such a whirlwind for that show so we had four weeks to rehearse um, and within that time not only did we have to learn our parts but we had to learn probably six or seven other roles there because of the nature of us all there were sort of probably like 300 different versions of the show if that makes sense because it wasn't as though we all played the same part every night and when one person changed not everybody changed so in a, it's hard to get your head around but there kind of were like 300 different sort of possible versions of the show so it kind of we called it the carousel in rehearsals and basically we would all be in the rehearsal room at all times. Someone would have a go at the scene and then the director would shout stop. And then the next actor would jump in and pick up from the same place. And it really did feel like we were kind of on this spinning teacup where we were just kind of like swept along and spat out in our first preview, but it was a real whirlwind. It wasn't the kind of rehearsal process where you do everything in order and you get to the end and you think, yes, I'm really prepared. It was, it was quite a hairy journey, but it was wonderful and exciting and, um, and um, none of us had ever done anything like it. So it was a really unique experience. But in terms of learning instruments, that was kind of the least of our problems <laughs> in that rehearsal process um, because of so much else to kind of get on top of, not least like packing up our lives because we were about to go on tour for two years. So funnily enough, that was kind of not the most difficult challenge in that particular process. Becky, uh, when auditioning, what type of monologue is better? to pick a dramatic monologue or a comedy? Very good question. So I would say, Becky, the most important thing is to really understand what you're auditioning for. Um, and that should usually guide your choice. So if, for example, you're auditioning for a, an Alan Akebourne play and it happens to be a kind of, if it happens to be a comedy, for example, and you know that you're playing the role um, a quite a comedic role, uh, then I would absolutely recommend choosing a comedy. Um, if you're auditioning for something like Hamlet and you're playing Ophelia or, or Desdemona or a character who suffered lots of hardship, then I'd think about something more dramatic. I guess your answer, your question is probably more in relation to maybe drama school auditions possibly, where, where, where it's not for a specific role. And in that case, I would recommend thinking about what your strengths are Generally, if you ask yourself the question, I think, what do I enjoy doing the most? It tends to be the same answer as what am I, what suits me best or what am I best at doing? Um, so my advice in that case is kind of to worry not so much about what you think they want to hear from you um, and try and get in touch more with an instinct of this is what I feel I do really, really well. Um, it's generally better, and I'd say that in relation to even auditions when you're working in the industry, you know, sometimes you get an audition for a job and you think that would be the most perfect song for that show, I'm gonna learn it, and, and it doesn't end up being as good as an audition where you just pick a song that you know already that you can absolutely do really well, even though it's kind of not necessarily the song you had in your mind. So I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, for me, it's about sort of really trying to get in touch with your instinct of what you relate to the best and what you feel is most, what you feel reflects you the best, the, the most accurately. Hope that makes sense. 
Um, Neen, oh my goodness, this is a good question. Do nerves ever get in the way of playing your instrument well? I play piano and whenever I get nervous before playing, my hands get super sweaty, which makes my fingers... You are describing the story of my life. So when I first got that role in Once, um, I, so I played the ex-girlfriend character for anyone that hasn't seen it, she is one of the violinists and um, she is the ex-girlfriend of the main guy. So she has a kind of small role, features in and out, but is largely part of the ensemble. And I was first cover, which meant that I was kind of the, the main understudy for the girl who was a pianist. Now I play a little bit of piano, but by no means I'm a, wouldn't describe myself as a sort of highly skilled pianist. So that for me in itself was a huge challenge. And all of my nerves on that show were based on messing up the piano so I remember sort of the first it was my first it was my professional debut and my West End debut and I was playing the lead and it was a huge out of body experience and I cannot describe to you sorry too much information for those of you that don't suffer from this but the piano was like an ice rink I was completely all over the place now I tried something which I don't recommend which was trying to treat rather than treating the source of the problem i.e like the nerves I covered my hands in this horrible thing, um, which is, I won't tell you what the name of the product was because I don't recommend it, but it was kind of like a really, really intense antiperspirant, which did stop myself from sweating, but I think it's very bad for you in all sorts of reasons because your body should sweat if it needs to. So all it meant is that my hands were very dry and my fingers got really swollen. It did mean I didn't sweat for a while on my fingers, um, but actually if I was doing it again, I think I'd work really hard on some sort of mindfulness, like really deep breathing lots of sort of tips and techniques for kind of trying to stay present and trying to sort of eliminate that nervous energy um but i absolutely relate to that question and actually for me it'd be interesting to know Neen, whether you play another instrument but for me i particularly i'm fearful of the piano because the violin is my main instrument it's what i know and it's i feel if i made a mistake on the violin i know the instrument well enough to correct it and get out of it Whereas on the piano, it, it feels like it's not my area and it frightens me. So I'm sorry that my advice isn't better because I share your, <laughs> share your worry. Um, but yeah, again, feel free to get in touch with the BYMT office and we can have it. They can forward me any questions you have on that. And we can talk more. Abby, jo Abby Jobson, I play clarinet. Do you think I should take on another instrument to broaden my opportunities? Yes, I think absolutely do. Um, again, I would say... Rather than thinking, you know, what's a good move in terms of what, you know, career wise, just have a think, what else, what else am I curious about? What else, what other instruments are, kind of excite me? Um, but with the clarinet, you can probably, I imagine you'd be able to pick up the tenor sax probably quite easily. I think they're quite interchangeable. Um, maybe other instruments in the wind family would be a good sort of shout because they're sort of they tend to be linked together in acting music shows. Yeah, I'd say absolutely. Um, have a think what, what makes you feel excited about learning. And I'd definitely say have a go. Carly, I think it is, or Callie, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. How do you get through auditions for shows you've done? Um, good question. I'm not sure if you mean in, in terms of how do you get through them and then how do you, how do you find them? Or how do you get to get to them. So I'll try and answer the question as broadly as I can. So um, in terms of how the auditions work, lots of you will know this already, but um, most actors have an agent and the agent submits you for the roles which come onto a platform called Spotlight and casting directors submit breakdowns for a show. So they will say, I need um, uh, an actor who is female who is from the age or looks like she could play between 20 and 30 and they will describe the character and the agents will think, oh, I have a client who would be really good at that and they submit them for it. If you then are invited to audition, you'll get sent a breakdown of what you need to prepare. So for an actor musician show, that would generally be a, a piece of music on your chosen instrument, generally unaccompanied. You might be asked to prepare a song, something they've sent to you or your own choice and generally uh, some dialogue, which probably they've sent to you. It's quite rare in once you're inside the industry to, to be asked to prepare a monologue. I think that's something that tends to happen more for drama school preparation. I've, I've never, I've worked in the industry for about 10 years. I've never been asked to take a monologue. It's always been to prepare a piece of script that I've been sent. 
Um, and in terms of, in case you mean, how do you get through them from a sort of nerves point of view? Um, I think the key is basically just being really prepared. So the, the auditions where I felt the most nervous have been the ones where I felt underprepared and the auditions that have gone the best tend to just be the ones that I've really spent the time doing the work for. So, um, and also there are some auditions that I go to and I, in my heart, I know I'm not right for the job and I tend to feel nervous about those ones as well. So I would just say if, if you can try to find the sort of um, the excitement and the opportunity to show what you can do. So enter, enter the space, enter the preparation, enter the room even with an energy of, I'm, I have got something to offer you. I, I'm really excited to share with you what I prepared. I think it's easy often to go into the room thinking, oh my God, everything could go wrong. And of course we do that. Um, but it's just about learning over time to keep reinforcing that message to yourself of I'm prepared. Um, I, I'm really valuable to this company. I would be able to contribute a lot and, I can't, and I'm excited about sharing that with you. Very good. Maya, I think, what did you study in college? So just to I'll repeat this very quickly, but I studied um, drama and English at the University of Bristol and I then went on to study uh, theatre and performance at Mount U Academy, which was kind of a musical theatre postgrad course. Gosh, lots of questions coming in. This is brilliant. Uh, Josie, what was your favourite show to be a part of and why? Ah, mm -hmm. oh, very good question. Two, I'm going to have to choose two. I hope you don't mind. Number one would 100% be the Hamlet job. Um, it was such a unique thing to be a part of for so many reasons, but it really changed my life because I got to see the world and I got to spend two years of my 20s. So I left when I was 24 and I came back when I was 26. And it kind of, the opportunity to travel um, changed a lot of things for me. I changed my perspectives on a lot of things. It really, really sort of formed a part of, I think, what my identity is now, what, what my values are, what, what, I, what I think about things, how I feel about sort of political issues, everything. Um, and in a way, it kind of broadened up until that point, my whole life had been about, um, well, it had been about sort of theatre and becoming a successful actor. And it is, that is still my career, but it kind of opened my mind to so many things. It kind of brought a massive shift in perspective for me, which I'm really grateful for. But the second job I'm really pleased I did was a little night music at the watermill because it's where I met my fiance. <laughs> he, um, he actually did BYMT as, a, as an adolescent teenager, but we didn't meet at that time. Um, but he, he and I played husband and wife in this show and um, yeah, fell in love in the summer and now we're getting married next year. So that was a, one of my favorite shows as well. Okay, um, Rebecca Phillips, what was it like in the mousetrap? I saw it in Torquay and the pace of the line delivery was fast. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation, Rebecca. Um, yeah. It, I think that's true. It is a very snappy show. And actually that's something I always appreciate when I see performances. So I'm glad it, the show you felt you saw felt snappy. I think often when the pace drags, it's hard to keep engaged. So um, if I'm really honest with you, the mousetrap was probably the most challenging job I've done. So as I, as I said before, I was playing Molly, who's the, the lead female. Um, and there were elements of the job I adored. I, we had a fantastic director, Hugh Ross, who gave us complete freedom uh, to make the roles our own. Often one of the challenges of stepping into a role that's already been created is that you can feel very confined to doing it how it's been done before. And you feel like you have less freedom to make the role your own. One of the things we were given permission to do was to really do that, to make, make the shows our own. We re-blocked it and it felt like a new play, which I'm really grateful for. The, the, the difficulty was that as I said, we did nine shows every week. Um, and because of the rules of our contract, we weren't permitted to take any holiday. So it was a five month block. And some people do it for longer. Some people do it for eight months or even a year. But for me, it was a five month block of just every day having to dig in and find the energy to do it again. And at that point, there were moments where I really truly felt exhausted. Um, that's probably not the very glamorous answer, but that's truthful really. Um, I actually, 
I, I can be honest about this because it's I'm transparent about it. But I I I, I communicated with the company, the producers of um, the Mousetrap, and I made it very clear that I felt it wasn't right to do nine shows a week and to ask that of actors if you're not going to grant them holiday. Uh, I felt that it was too much, and you and actually you're putting your bodies and your minds under too much strain. Um, and I worked with Equity, who are the uh, the union for actors to sort of have those conversations. And that leads me on to something else actually, which I wanted to sort of talk about, which is the importance of that body that of, of equity. So if and when you join the industry um, and you get your first professional roles, this will all be something that you're introduced to then. But it's so important, I feel, to support that union and um, to give them your support in fighting to protect your rights as an actor. Often as an actor, you can feel as though you're sort of sometimes not all the time but you're you're not necessarily being heard a lot by management and things like that so that's a really important way of making your voice heard and um, and also kind of joining in that that sort of shared sense of collectively joining together to to make things better really so that's my political spiel so please so in fact you can do it now and start to think what is equity and why is it important i think it's a really important thing and I think actually, if you start to take ownership and responsibility of those areas of the industry, you, you can feel more in control. Often as an actor, you feel you're just waiting for the phone to ring and, you know, you, your career is sort of in someone else's hands. But actually, one of the things you can do is really take responsibility for making the industry a better place. We can all do that as actors. And often we don't because we feel helpless and there's nothing to be changed. But I really do believe in that in sort of, you know, if you want the industry to be better, if you want if you want to start a movement for making sure that casting directors tell you no when you haven't got a role, then you can make that change happen. Long answer, probably wasn't what you were looking for, Rebecca, but there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Let's have a look here. Ah, interesting. Neem, were you recommending A-levels that haven't got anything to do with theatre? Absolutely, yeah. Maths, biology and chemistry at A-level. I think that's brilliant. I would, I say absolutely don't base your A-levels on what, you know, knowing that you want to go into theatre. If anything, having a broader base, in my opinion, is, is a really good thing. So choose your A-levels based on what you love and what you think you're good at and, and all of that. But I would say don't limit your choices because you're looking to pursue a particular path. Um, particularly in the theatre, it, it's, it's rarely relevant what you did at A-level anyway. So definitely don't make those decisions based on, in my opinion, what, you know where you think you're going to end up um i think it's great if you, if you are good and love maths biology and chemistry i'm so impressed <laughs> so yeah lauren fitzgerald is it best to study a degree in actor musicianship or musical theater really interesting question now so as you know i didn't study actor musicianship um there are lots of people who'd argue both ways here but my personal view is i think i got a lot out of not studying act musicianship specifically because I was able to kind of build a broad base of why well, it's a difficult one actually so as I said my personal view is I'm glad I didn't specify I'm glad I kept it broad so I I'd learned how to do you know Shakespeare and musical theatre and all of that kind of stuff in a broader sense my my concern maybe about the act musicianship courses is that once you come out of them, if you have that on your CV, maybe it's quite a narrow pool. So you, you kind of very much get shepherded into a very small section of actors who are actor musicians. I've always felt I want to be an actor who plays an instrument rather than defined as an actor musician because I wanted to have access to other types of theatre. Having said that, I'm sure that those people that studied actor musicianship are much better musicians than I am and I'll probably have learned a lot more um, specifically about that type of craft but uh, my view is that I have had I think it's easier to tap into the act musician world which is quite small than it is to be in that bracket and try and reach out to the other areas of the industry like more commercial musical theatre or straight acting that's my personal view hope that makes sense um what job did you learn from the most oh my goodness oh there's so many more questions i want to get through so i'm going to try and keep these really quick um oh, oh. 
the globe job and the mousetrap both because they really asked me to think deeply about how to keep it fresh which is kind of what i'm keep coming back to um the thing i learned on both of those jobs was and it kind of changed things for me i read a book called the actor and the target um it's a book by declan donnellan uh I really recommend it. I might see if the BYNT office can link that in the notes somehow. Um, the book basically argues or makes clear that when you're acting, you need to have a target. You can't act in a vacuum. You can't just be on stage acting. You have to be trying to do something to another person. Um, it, it really changed things for me because it meant that when I was doing a long run in Hamlet, we did it for two years. The Mousetrap did it for five months, but every day, every night three times, two times a day sometimes. It really helped me to every night commit to what I was doing in that moment. So lots of you might know about objectives and actions and that kind of thing. And I won't get into detail of that now because we don't have time, but it made me really commit to every night playing the action. So I was talking to a person to catch on stage and I was actively trying to get them to do something so that it might be, I wanted them to listen to me. I wanted them to um, pass me the bottle of wine. It can be something really specific, but I think as long as you're truly playing those actions in the moment and listening and responding, that's how you keep it fresh. And that's what I learned on those jobs. So I think before that, I, was, I tended to be a bit more like, I, this, is my, this is my acting and I'm going to do it now. And I think I realised that actually it's so live and it's so much a relationship and a dance and a conversation that happens. And it relies on you being alert and engaged with the target, the other person. So that's, that probably had been my biggest lesson in my career. Um, oh, I'm more of a singer, try to pick up instruments a couple of times, but I've never really progressed very far in anything but things like kazoos. I love the kazoo. Do you have any recommendations for easy instruments I could start? Ukulele. I am such a big fan of the ukulele. I just think they're so cheap. Buy one, look at some chords online, and you're off and away. I really can, I think that's a really simple answer for me. Ukulele, give it a go. Good luck. Okay, Loris, I think. How hard are the instrument part back to musicians? Oh yeah, really good question. And again, it really depends on the show. So when I did a little night music, it was quite an involved classical, quite challenging, quite some of the parts as, as it was with once, but I've also done other shows where it is much more kind of like long sustained notes on the violin and a more of a pop soundtrack. It really depends on the person that's doing the arranging. Um, and if you work with a brilliant arranger, Sarah Travis is, the, is the, um, the woman that I've worked with many times and I think is just an extraordinary creative person and just a fantastic arranger. Her job is to write arrangements that are at the appropriate level for the actor. So a really good arranger, a really good musical director and a really good arranger will look at a company of actors and know how to create parts and write scores and write individual instrumental lines that fit the ability of each person. So in a way, your job is just to get as good as you can at the instruments and then you let the arranger worry about at what level to write them, if that makes sense. You rarely walk into an audition room and the parts have already been written. They tend to be written for the company of actor musicians. Hope that makes sense. I can read music but can't sight within the spot. Would this ever be a setback? No, I don't think it is actually. Not many people in the industry, do, well, lots of people do, but lots of people don't sight read. The only area I find it very useful, I do some session singing. And in that regard, it's really helpful to be able to sight read because um, you tend to walk into a studio and get given music and you have to do it. But in theatre jobs, it tends to be much more, um, they will account for the fact that most people in the company wouldn't read music. It's by no means a necessity. Maisie Lake, kind of an odd one, but in auditions, more so drama school auditions, is it worth taking the risk and changing things in the room? Really good question. Really good question. For those of you that can't see it, I think you can, but is it worth taking a risk and changing things in the room to show spontaneity and keep it fresh? Or is it better to play safe and perform it as rehearsed? It's a really good question that, Maisie. I think, um, so my view is to always, as I said before, keep your target in mind. So remember, even if that target is an imagined person, 
So you might look like you're staring in space, but you have to know in your mind, who am I talking to? And as long as that relationship is present and active, in a way, that will guide what your performance is. So rather than thinking like, I'm going to do what I prepared, if you're truly present in that kind of, I am trying to do something to the person, something might change and it doesn't matter. What I would say to avoid is changing it for the sake of it. So sometimes when we're on long jobs, we think, oh, I'm really bored of how I have to do it every night. I'm just going to do it differently just for fun. I would, I would kind of guard against doing that because I think often that can just muddy the sort of clarity of the text and the meaning of what's happening. So I would say don't do it differently just for the sake of spontaneity, but don't be afraid of, of it becoming different if it's a result of you being really, really true to what you're trying to do to the other person. I hope that makes sense. Really happy to answer that in a bit more detail. So do feel free to send any questions via the UIMT office on that one. Good question. Okay. 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 Got three minutes left. I'm going to whiz through. Oh, look. Well, again, this is perfect timing. I'm struggling to control Abby, my larynx at the moment, and I'm really scared about damaging my voice. What tips have you got for not straining your voice and singing? It's really hard for me to answer that, Abby, without um, knowing your voice and hearing you sing. But I would just say make sure you're working with a teacher um, to, uh, who can help you with this specifically. As long, I would just say, if you're not feeling, if you feel any pain at any point, just always stop. Um, you, you shouldn't, it's quite difficult to cause damage to your voice. You have to really be like hitting it hard over and over again, relentlessly. So don't be scared and afraid, but equally be mindful. And if you do experience any pain in that area, do stop and consult a vocal coach or a singing teacher who'll be able to help you. Alice Rimmer, oh my goodness, such a big question. And two minutes left. How do you deal with rejection and stay motivated? It is very hard, which is why for me, it's really important, as I keep saying, to cultivate other areas of your life that give you um, satisfaction, value, and purpose. I think if my whole life was built around my identity as an actor, I would feel very crushed every time I get rejected. And I, we all get rejected a lot of the time, most of the time. Um, I work really hard to cultivate my identity as a teacher, as a friend, as a, uh, as an aunt, like all, all the other kind of areas of my life, um, other hobbies, other things I like doing, um, in order to kind of give myself a sense that I am like a rounded person and my identity is not just derived from this one thing over which I have no control. Um, so I just say, keep going and try and keep perspective. Yes, you want to be an actor in that is the thing that motivates you but you you have other talents other skills other things that people value you for and um, and help and having that in mind always helps me stay motivated last question can't believe we've got to the end i want to keep my future in theaters very broad how do i do that in terms of university courses great question um i would say doing something like i'm not sure if you're related you're referring to acting courses but i would say avoid doing something too specific if you know you want to have a broad choice so avoid something like you know contemporary dance or act musicianship or shakespeare and go for, for one of the more kind of drama courses or something if you're into english or if you're into i don't know whatever subjects don't worry too much if it's a university course you would probably likely want to go on and do a postgraduate degree in theater so I would say don't worry too much about what the university course is. Choose a subject you love um, because you're passionate about it. Don't, I would avoid trying to think tactically about the choice, the, co the course you choose, because ultimately you need to choose a course that you are passionate about and that you enjoy. Otherwise you won't get so much out of it. Okay, that was a marathon, I think. We've answered lots and lots of questions loads of things that we haven't covered but lots of things that we have and um it's been real pleasure thank you for having me and do feel free to swing any further questions through the office and they'll forward them on to me and uh it's been a pleasure thank you so much for joining goodbye <laughs>